Everyone, gather round. Gather round, quickly. I want to tell you something. You see this uh, scrap of paper? Another message from the Senate. Ah, well, days come and go, don't they? What is it they want this time? Begging for my approval on some trivial motion? No, no, not this time. They simply wish to tell me that they finally have decided on a new co-consul for me. Well, it's nice to get to choose who you marry, but we all know the reality of things. So fine, I will simply have to go along with it. But who do they choose, you ask? Well, have you ever heard of a commander named Marcus Perra? No? Luckily, I count myself among the few who have met him before. He was a commander of the Praetorian Guard for a time, then commander of some patrol or another. That's about it. Truly a master of statecraft and a famous warrior, worthy of the highest office. Oh, but if you think that's funny, did you know that my poor little brother Uther came to the Senate three times in the last year, asking to be made consul? Even with their options so bare as to drag Pera up to the front, they knew that a bastard son was not worth their time. Back to obscurity you go, my little man. But anyway, Pera, the man commanding the troops meant for me, I should note, is going to fight in Africa. So, I thought we should start passing a helmet around to collect for his poor family. The cost of a funeral for a consul is going to weigh very heavily on them indeed. So, what will it be once he's dead? Well, there's my nephew, who has yet to visit, that Eutropius. I've rather heard he's a bit of a wet blanket, though. I think we're going to have to start making the Senate see that there is a reason the old Empire disposed of the idea of a dual consulship. One man gets a lot more done, as it turns out. Hello and welcome back to Fields of Mars. In the previous episode, after taking Alexandria, Constans moved on to attack a Garamantian settlement with the real objective of forcing one of their fleets to land so he could defeat it in a regular battle, and that worked out pretty well. We also captured the settlement and turned it into a new ally. Then we did a raid against some Sassanid forces on the coast, trying to take a settlement using only a fleet, and it basically worked out in the end despite being harder than expected. Constans moved south to kill more Sassanids, basically just taking back territory to secure Egypt while he waits for the Sassanids to counterattack. And finally we saw Pera destroying the Lachmids on Sicily, and now he's preparing to move south into Africa. Now at the start of the next turn we learn of another unfortunate death, another of Constanze's enemies, one of the guys who was badmouthing his kids, has mysteriously disappeared, so perhaps people will begin to learn the lesson now. We've also got some attention on Alexandria, the Lachmids and the Sassanids currently have forces nearby, the Lachmids just standing in the river delta there. Now there's only one way to get to Alexandria from the other side, the eastern side of the Nile, and that's to cross at a little choke point that Constanze can now just stand on. So that guarantees somewhat our defences. We can also upgrade the cavalry because that place we just captured down to the south has a high level cavalry building. Very nice. And I managed to get into reinforcement range of Alexandria as well. We learned that Septimus has gained the trait of being sweary. I think he might be getting a little bitter up in Constantinopolis having seen his plans basically utterly fail in Asia. So now he continues his defensive mission against the gathering Sassanids. The Huns are still hanging around near Aurelianus and he's still doing nothing basically on the defense as well, currently defending the place where we're building the legionary barracks, after which we'll be able to upgrade all of our forces in the area. Now, Pera has taken two ships to who, uh, begin his mission of going out towards Africa, just deciding which route to take. Wanted to stay vaguely close to land so that we could escape onto land if we get into a spot of trouble. And we get into trouble straight away. The Garamantians have far more in the area than predicted. Immediately, we are attacked by one and a half fleets and a full stack of troops in transport ships. Not good at all. The destruction of their fleet over to the east did not represent the destruction of their naval 
naval strength, clearly. So Pera moves back with his fleet, but it's not far enough, and the enemy fleets continue their offensive. So we've now got basically the same battle, but without the transport ships. So that's going to be a bit easier, but still we're facing actual naval ships, and most of our fleet is going to be just transports. Plus, the enemy navy is absolutely filled with siege ships, with catapults, which are the bane of the slow-moving, low-health transport ships. So overall, not looking too nice. We do get a couple of extra ships coming in from the garrison at Syracuse, so that's something at least. So there's only really one viable strategy for this battle, and that is to rush. We need to get all those siege ships into a melee so that they can't be firing at us. So that's something our transport ships will be good for, since they're not good for anything else. At least in this battle, the only one strategy we have will be able to make use of transport ships and their boarding abilities. To start the battle, I'm sending my smallest ship out ahead of the fleet to basically try and draw fire from the siege ships to avoid them firing at the main body of the fleet. This small ship is maneuverable and can dodge many of the shots, but what it can't do is dodge everything else. We do need to keep in mind that the enemy does have a pretty substantial regular naval force with archers, skirmishers and boarding forces, and they're going to be taking us down as well, so my kiting ship basically didn't last very long at all. And then their siege ship started absolutely piling that fire on to everything else and we started losing ships fast here though their admiral came to board one of my ships and then the siege ships did some nice friendly fire for me and actually sunk their own admiral so that was very kind of them that's a nice start a ship i sent forward on the right to try and rush into the blob of siege ships was immediately destroyed there are so many of them that you can't really get close because even though they're somewhat inaccurate uh, with enough of them firing they're pretty much guaranteed to kill any ship that gets anywhere near them so that's going to make rushing pretty hard in the center, basically a big blobby mess ensued as our own uh, boarding naval ships engaged with theirs. But the siege ships firing regular shot instead of flaming shot into that were basically sinking our ships one by one. And our transport fleet had yet to properly arrive. I can, as you can see, move it around to the left flank of the enemy's blobbed up formation in order to get a pretty decent chance of hitting those siege ships at the back while avoiding all of the regular ships. I'm trying to do something similar on the other flank with these two ships, but they're just getting annihilated. The first one set on fire by hits from the siege ships, the other one being damaged by fire arrows and having the crew slowly taken out, but it's still going okay. But the siege ships are now firing regular boulders at them, which just do hull damage, and pretty soon that ship's going to be sinking as well. Another failed attack. We just can't do anything about these siege ships. They are managing to keep themselves out of our reach. Uh, now, as the transport started to come in, the enemy started just setting them on fire with flaming arrows. I think possibly because of the hot Mediterranean weather, fire arrows are super effective. Plus, these uh, transports have low fire damage health, or the sort of second health bar you have to represent how hard it is to set the ship on fire which means basically a few fire arrows will destroy the ship. So that is becoming a massive problem. Pera is still alive, leading this ship nearest to the camera just there. But basically, we're losing all of these elite troops. All of our legionaries are just being sunk with basically no fight at all. Sail! Sail! At them without halt! No Roman pines for his safety, no Roman cares for the lick of flame or the rush of water, for it is not those that we take into the afterlife. The legacy, the glory and honour, the victories, that is what we hold on to for eternity. Well, don't keep looking at me, you idiots. Get those shields up. And where are those legionaries? I told them to follow me into the fray. Are they... Ah... Well, that would be their sail, in as far as ash on the wind can be called sail. Everyone hold fast, hold fast and true. I think we should make it a priority to take a more sturdy ship from the enemy, something that won't betray us so easily. Whatever happens, men, keep hold of your sword. Let Neptune know that you are Romans and are to be treated as kings. Very, very quickly indeed, the last of our fleet is disappearing. They're just setting all our transport ships on fire with these flaming arrows. Their siege ships are out of ammunition at this point. So that's nice, but it's not helping because the fire is easily enough to destroy everything we have now. And their siege component is now just sailing forwards, which is, of course, counteracting the fact that we finally got ships around to the back of the enemy's fleet to try and take them out. So basically everything has been a complete failure. This unit of spear cohort will have an easy time taking some 
some revenge against a siege crew they managed to board with. But basically, everything is just coming down to Pera. He's the one ship who's actually in range of the enemy and has the ability to board or do anything. Tried to board with this easy siege ship, but it somehow just sneaks away there, plus more enemy ships come in to board with him instead. So he'll end up just fighting to defend his own ship, which is not what he wants to be doing, because his own ship is being bombarded with fire arrows. You can see the smoke rising already. Not looking good. In comes the crew of the enemy ship for a quick fight. His Palatina guards aren't very good, and they're probably seasick, so that's not really a fight we want to be doing. But we won't have to do it, because our ship is, of course, set on fire. The enemy crew will just abandon the ship, and our guys will be going down with their ship. They will not try to escape, basically. They're in huge trouble, so now all these Palatina guards wearing all this chain mail and heavy armor are going to have to swim for it. That's not going to work, and Pera, of course, is going to be among them. We get a message telling us our ally general has been killed, but yes, it was our own general Pera's in amongst this group here. That is the end of that. The spear cohort fought on valiantly at the end, but eventually their morale broke, so even though the ship was not destroyed, the battle is going to come to an end. They were having an easier time just because of the arrangement of the enemy ships was blocking uh, other ships from attacking them, but their boat was on fire by the end of it, as we can see here. It's a valiant defeat for our country combined transport and naval force. Not what we needed. That has ruined our invasion of Africa and, of course, has destroyed a massive amount of our elite troops. So we can see we basically lost everything there. One unit among our army surviving somehow. The enemy losing quite a lot as well, actually. We did take down a number of ships with us and destroyed a lot of the crew on other ships. So that one unit who escaped those spear cohort at the end will survive to tell the tale. But basically, we're now really, really exposed. We have pretty much no military forces anywhere in the center of the map. So if the Garamantians want to attack, they can. Before that, though, we're going to look at Septimus. I decided he was a little bit restless and could move out to attack the Sassanids, and we actually had this opportunity because they ungarrisoned Nicomedia for whatever reason. So I thought we'd just move forwards and just quickly order us off the garrison. A big garrison, but consisting mainly of weak units, so no problem for our army to just destroy them. The question was, what do we actually do with this victory? Because now we have command over Nicomedia, we don't really have the ability to occupy it as we've seen before. And if Septimus wants to truly take the lessons of his father to heart, we should raise it. That is the tactical thing to do, just deny the Sassanids the region so they can't use it to attack us. But I decided that he wouldn't want to raise it, being that he wasn't completely as ruthless as Constance in these matters, so instead we're going to go for the sack, which has the partial advantage of giving us some money as well, although money, not necessarily a problem, because the loss of that army in Sicily means we actually now have a substantial income. Aaron back at it again by declaring war on us, we've been at war with them on and off over the last many years of the campaign, so now we are on war, we'll see if they actually do anything with that, and here was the interesting turn, the Garamantian one, and in fact they just ran away, they seemed to stand down, I thought they would press their advantage with that army we saw in transport ships uh, just before they attacked our navy, but apparently not, so that is excellent news. It looks like we might actually get away with this. Eutropius is going to have to move back from his old duties of uh, defending Italia, which he inherited from Pera, to now once again inherit from Pera the duty of being on the front line. What he won't be inheriting is an army. He gets the spear cohort, but really he's just got all these Western Auxilia Palatina who aren't all that bad, but basically aren't going to be very versatile and won't be able to stop full stack invasions. With any luck, he'll be able to hire something else in the future. Right now, we're going to take a look at Constance, who basically waited for those Lachmids to attack, but they didn't. You can see they're fortified there. I wanted to see if my fleet would be allowed to reinforce if I attacked a fort, because fort battles can't take place on coastal maps, as far as I know. But the enemy just retreat, and we ended up facing them in a normal battle where we have a gigantic advantage, because the fleet is still there to reinforce. So I don't know if the enemy considered that fleet part of the battle the first time. It's possible they would have retreated even if they didn't because Constance's army is powerful, but whatever the case, we ought to resolve away yet another Lachmid army. The Lachmids not proving to be a very formidable foe, mainly because although they have all the other troops of the Sassanid Empire, they don't bring the Severan cavalry, the crossbow cavs, so basically they are a lot weaker as a result. Now, at the start of the next turn, we've got some uh, slightly worrying news. It seems that both Egypt and Judea, the two allied Roman states recreated to support Constance, have dropped Greco-Roman paganism and adopted Greek Christianity. 
So that was never part of the deal. They were forced to be Roman pagan as part of the liberation plan, so not very nice of them. We also get some news that a new faction has appeared over here in Gaul. It's another of these uh, Roman-esque factions, Septimania this one's called, some sort of special version of Gaul, I believe. So we can see that the Western Roman Empire has been pushed back. They were advancing on the Alamans and seem to be taking territory, but it's all been taken away. And there's a Hun client state, one of the Far Eastern factions, has actually arrived somehow to push them back as well. Although a few Gaulish separatists are still holding out. As long as things remain stable, we can just continue to ignore it. What remained of the Senate's army was in fact even less than it would first seem. The survivors were all from the same cohort, the cohort that had followed Pera into battle. They escaped with their lives, their ship, and even their weapons and armor, but they did not keep their sanity. All of them are asking the same questions of the gods. Of an army killed almost to the last man, why was it they who lived? They are guilty. The lives of their brothers were spent for them without warning. What are they to do with the years they have left, knowing how they came into possession of them? They are over as soldiers, over as men. I will ask only that they aid in the training of replacements before they are retired. It can't happen soon enough. The legionary barracks in Macedonia is now ready, so it's time for Aurelianus to start kitting out his army with all of the new gear and training, starting with the lighter units first to make it uh, a little bit cheaper overall to go through the recruitment process since you don't waste turns with your heavy infantry just sitting there waiting for the light infantry to show up. Now after that, Constans was left without anything to do, so I started sending him south. There is one or more region in the pro province of Egypt which we can go and take. I'm presuming the Sassanids haven't bothered defending it because if there was something there, probably would have attacked me by now but the Sassanids do have an attack in mind as usual they've got more stuff waiting just off screen and now they're coming for Alexandria they actually lay siege to it there a bit worrying because we only have like four half dead units as the garrison in Alexandria I think and another stack appeared there as well so they've got two stacks besieging and one stack that appears to be following behind ready to come and support so next turn they'll have an overwhelming force there and probably be able to take the settlement. We do have our fleet there but we know the capture point in Alexandria is not in range of naval attacks so we'd have to just land the marines and we just don't have enough of them to hold the enemy out of the city. So we really needed Constans to come back and break this siege but he can't reach it right now. He can reach the choke point just to the east so one thing he can do is stand on that choke point to stop that third army from being able to reach the siege. So so that may do something, but it doesn't prevent the Sassanids from attacking it in the next end turn sequence if they have the siege equipment available, perhaps onagers, or have managed to build a ladder during this turn. So it was really just a case of waiting to see what they did. And here was what they did do. They broke off one army from the siege to attack Constance in the rear. Another one appears to attack Constance from the front. So now he's being attacked from two sides by two armies. The balance bar equal though, thanks to the eliteness of his own troops. But of course, these two Sassanid armies, exactly what you'd expect, full of cataphracts, full of crossbow calf. Now I could have retreated here, but I wanted to try and fight it so that I avoided retreating to a position where the third army laying the siege would also come into the battle. Now I actually fought this battle twice due to technical difficulties and here is something that happened the second time. You can see I wanted to intercept the enemy's uh, rear attack army by just hitting it right on the edge of the battlefield, taking out this crossbow calf before they could have a chance to fire, but they ended up coming in on the top left portion of the map, which is actually where I expected them to come in, given their position on the campaign map. And so, of course, now we switch to what happened the first time I tried to do it, where I was standing here, and almost inevitably, they actually came on in the bottom left. So you can see the second time I was trying to anticipate my foreknowledge they would come down here, but they didn't. So <laughs> I guess that teaches me for cheating. Now, I am going to show the footage from the first version of the battle, even though the second one, obviously, is the one that will actually affect the campaign map, because they were sort of similar, but the second time I basically just corner camped in the bottom left hand corner 
because I was so annoyed about having to fight the battle again. I just did the most exploitative tactics possible. And I'm not exactly being unexploitative in my official run here. I'm sitting in the top left and I have a little bit of an excuse because the, the best terrain on the map is also up here. I can use the river and the trees to defend against cavalry charges and crossbow attacks. The problem with setting up here is that it was slow to move over there so our onagers didn't arrive in time. I told them to drop the siege pieces and just run for it as the enemy's first unit started to arrive but of course the crossbows can just cut them down and this onager crew seemed quite determined to actually take part in the battle. They kept turning around wanting to go into melee. You can see that little yellow line there. I'm constantly giving them orders over and over again to just sprint back to our position but they're not really having any of it unfortunately. So they are going to be defeated, not going to have a big impact on the fight and no impact on the campaign, of course, because they actually survived in the second attempt, I think, anyway. So the main part of this battle is, like any battle with the Sassanids, sitting and getting shot by these crossbows. And I'm taking a close look at them here to investigate their rate of fire, and you can see the, uh, the answer to the mystery of their rate of fire, which was itself the answer to the mystery of why they are so good, is that they don't have to draw the crossbows. And of course, the fact you have to draw a crossbow is is its main problem. It takes a long time to draw a crossbow and that's why they're supposed to fire very slowly but not for these guys. They have got some kind of like breech loading rifle version of the crossbow where you just put the bolt in and it flies out. So <laughs> that explains a lot I guess. We're gonna have to just sit and take it though. There's nothing we can do about it now that we know why they are firing so quickly. So the rest of the battle is just going to get started now as the enemy's army starts to arrive. My cavalry, as we saw there, were out on the flank, but are quickly running back behind our lines once the enemy discovered their hidden position. Because it's a misty day, uh, when the enemy discover me, that's the same time I'm discovering them. So unfortunately, I didn't foresee them finding my cavalry there. And I'm also messing up my defences by accidentally moving a spear unit off the front line, now replacing it with a sword unit because I didn't realise I'd made that mistake. And one unit of cavalry that did manage to stay outside of our own line is now going to sneak around to just wait behind the enemy army. We will come back to them later. For now, let's just take this beating. I didn't think you were being serious. We push ourselves to breaking point in training, drawing these so-called gods' bows. And then when faced with an unholy enemy, they simply fire themselves. Mm, that is right, my brother. Uh, now you see that the Great One is with us undeniably. Oh, I was sceptical too at first. Uh, that man was so strange, suddenly appearing in crazy clothes and claiming that the device he carried was a, uh, oh, what was it again? A uh, magnetical railgun or something? Oh, he said that Aura Mazda had instructed him to gift it to us. We all thought it was a lie by some Roman spy with a tempered water pipe, uh, but it was all true, mate. If the bow can be made to fire itself, can the horse and even the man not be made to walk, talk and act themselves? That is the future, brother! The enemy will of course be attacking us with melee units as well, including these elephants in the center smashing through our legionaries who occasionally remember to just throw their peeler to bring them down. So soon enough we take down the first unit of elephants, but that is only the beginning. Next door we've got cataphracts attacking us, that's going to be most of the attacks coming in in terms of melee things. They're going to do decent damage against our men, especially when they're out of stationary to Studo. And some of these guys in the center are out specifically to allow them to throw their javelins because they can't throw them while they're in it for whatever reason and we basically need to bring down these elephants and javelins is really the only way to do it. This unit here currently freed from melee by the cataphracts just walking away is in a great position to do so but you can see the unit's actually been turned by this previous attack so now it's opening up a big gap in the, in the line as it forms up facing the wrong direction. I ordered them into stationary test judo because they were about to be charged not realizing they were facing the wrong direction so they form up facing those elephants and then take the charge into their back. Luckily it wasn't a cataphract charge it was regular cavalry. If it had been cataphracts, they probably would have been wiped out entirely, but they are going to be able to hold just taking losses and try to get back into position in the line. Those elephants will now have to be brought down by these archers who will probably kill some of our own troops, but it is better than nothing. Luckily, the elephants actually routing there our men. Hopefully, we'll kill them before they come back from routing. We've got problems, though. The enemy have broken through just down on our right and are now totally outflanking everything. Their general just tearing down our back lines. Luckily, he died in the process someone managed to bring him down. 
So that is an excellent move. That's actually the general of their reinforcing army, I believe. So many of the troops don't get a morale deeper from that, but hopefully it will be helpful nonetheless. So the right flank is where things are a little bit better overall. The enemy's cavalry charge is weak and the infantry not really paying attention. It's mostly their ranged cav over here. So I was actually starting to take units off the line, but uh, one of the units ran out of ammunition and charged forwards, hitting their spear cohort. And actually, despite being a horse archer, you know, doing pretty good damage to them. Their charge bonus is sufficient to damage even heavy spear units. You can see I'm moving units forwards that haven't engaged yet. The idea is to draw the enemy's crossbow fire onto the inferior melee units to try and save some of the lives of the men in the center who need to be kept alive to fight in these melees, which are just turning into gigantic grinds. They've even deployed here legionary defectors against us, so guys who used to be part of the Eastern Roman Empire now fighting for the Sassanid Empire will hopefully take some revenge on those traitors. Now that unit of cavalry that I sent out from the battle earlier comes back in to attack the enemy's general who was just sitting around in this river. It was a fight this unit couldn't really win but my hope was that they might just somehow kill that general and getting rid of him would relieve some of the pressure so it was worth the risk. Otherwise we're just going to be sitting here grinding through everything. We don't have much of a choice really because we can't move and at least the enemy are deploying some of their inferior troops into melee now like those skirmishers there and their worst cavalry are now being used because their cataphracts are pretty much expended and those cavalry don't do very well against legionaries. We managed to shatter that enemy general's unit with the support of another unit of allied cav had to send in to help out. I don't know if he actually died but it's still going to have a negative effect on enemy morale. We lost one of our units and I thought uh, the other one might be able to escape but the problem as we are near some crossbow cav and you can see our unit just, just disappears before our eyes uh, I just wanted to show that in case anyone was wondering whether it's really so good to be so defensive against crossbow cav uh, that's the answer if you go near crossbow cav your unit is simply deleted in a matter of seconds you cannot do anything against them while they still have their ammunition especially because you usually can't catch them and force them into melee if you want to actually go on an offensive against them this unit of Cohort Auxilia being very dedicated in maintaining their stationary to Studo, the front line even going underwater to make sure that their unit is protected. Very dedicated. So this is basically our battle plan where you're just going to sit here and try to drain all of the enemy's ammunition. Most of their melee units have at this point in the fight actually been defeated. So have ours, both sides taking massive damage in the big grindy fights. But there was still one play the enemy had left to make in terms of melee attacks. They had some cataphracts and some saffron cavalry out of ammunition who pushed through on a completely exposed left flank where we basically have no infantry left to defend it and started attacking our archers at the back. I've got half a unit of cavalry to try and counter with, perhaps not enough, but the enemy's morale is low at this point. So we may be able to win on morale if not properly. And I'm also going to send over some infantry to try and support that fight if it goes on for long. We've still got a pretty healthy unit of spearmen that's been walking around up and down the line just plugging gaps so they should be able to help out we also have to send in Constans to fight because we don't really have anything. He is going to have to be countering the charges from these uh, crossbow cavalry ran out of ammunition. The problem is the other guys behind them immediately fire at Constans if he comes into range. He loses a third of his unit there in the blink of an eye and has to, has to rush away from the front line to avoid anything else like that. Really, we do need to just settle down and wait, try and take all the fire we can and get moments like this where the enemy charge forwards with no ammunition and then get into melees where they will have a disadvantage. Savran cavalry, especially the elite Savran cavalry aren't absolutely terrible in melee. They can fight melee units for a short while, but their morale is going to be low, so we only have to kill a few of them in these melees to take out the unit. That unit there, surprised to find my legionaries in hiding in that forest there. I had a few more troops than the enemy suspected, at least, even if I have barely any. So soon enough, we basically apply that method against all of the crossbow cav and eventually take them out one by one. The battle comes to an end in a close victory. The second playthrough of the battle was also a close victory. It was just a little bit less interesting in terms of the footage. We'll see the real results in the next episode, of course. The border between Rome and the Sassanid Empire had been essentially defined by the back and forth fighting of a northern and western Anatolia. Neither side could make a lasting impression on the other, and with Constans moving the focus of the war to Egypt, the natural barrier provided by the Sea of Marmara became a de facto military boundary, despite both empires claiming rights to territories on either side of it. 
The Roman mandate to restore eastern provinces to the control of Constantinopolis was forcibly abandoned, not least so because the will of the Senate in Rome was becoming increasingly relevant in Constans's absence. Some were even saying that Aurelianus, once holder of a consulship, might be returned to legal power. So thanks for watching everyone, there'll be plenty more action for Constans, as the thing that usually happens when you defeat the Sassanids happens again, plus the Garamantians appear to threaten us from another direction in the next episode of Fields of Mars.